up crush the darkness we're going to look at this as a church body and i want us to really focus on what the lord did for you he crushed the darkness for he is the light of the world and we are children of the light he made a fool i'm telling you death thought it's over we got him but he made a fool the darkness and death and the grave. Hallelujah. If there's not hope in that, honey, I don't know what to do for you tonight. Let's go to the next verse. Oh, King Jesus, you made a royal priesthood out of somebody that was a slave to sin. You came along told me how to repent, showed me the plan. I accepted the plan. I was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of another tongue. And honey, you made me, God, you made me a royal priesthood. Uh-huh, now. Now there's breakthrough. You see, there's no breakthrough, really, till you're born again of water and spirit. If you haven't been born again, you got to be. Jesus said, marvel not, you must be born again. And if you are born again, there is nothing in this life that can bind you if you're walking in the authority. Standing in the victory. Knowing that death can't. There is no sting of death to a born-again Christian. It's just a one-way ticket home. You heard me. Not a round trip. Oh, my God of heaven. You don't need COVID vaccinations. You don't need to take a COVID test. Oh, you don't need a passport because I got one. When I took his name, that's the only passport I need. You know, we sing these songs, and sometimes you don't realize the power in these words. Amen. It excites me. Just a little while ago, I'm a little winded from this morning, but I said, Lord, I'm an old man, but I still love to worship. Amen. I can see me as time goes on, whether I got to have a crutch or what. Brother Hillman, I know that you're the same age now, but in a few months, I'll be one year older. Don't bring out the crutch yet. I may have to wear knee braces and back braces and all kind of braces. Uh, but when the Lord begins to move upon me, honey, I'm going to do something and worship the Lord. Why? Why? Amen. Because he delivered me from the fear of death. Amen. Let's sing another song to the Lord. All right. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. It's okay if you get excited. It's all right if you do some moving. It's all right if you do some 
Shouting, it's all right. I said, it's all right. It's all right. Oh, I'm telling you, it's all right. I know you're tired. I'm tired. Who isn't tired? We get up tired. We go to bed tired. We go through work tired. Every day we're tired. But I'm telling you, sometimes uh, you just got to force yourself. Make yourself. Magnify the king of glory. All right. I'm ready. I'm waiting on y'all. I'm waiting on y'all. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm waiting on you. I, I really, I don't need a song. I got a melody in my heart. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Man, I feel a kick. It may not be as high as the one foot, but I can feel kick. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. to the Lord God. God is a wonderful God, isn't he? Amen, amen. Amen, amen. You can return to your seats. We're going to get our announcements, Brother Hillman. He's going to bring our announcements, and right after our announcements and our offering, Brother Scotty, who, who's supposed to be doing it on Sunday mornings, but he's a little timid and shy yet, but we're going to break him from that. He's going to have a breakout. So we're going to let him do it tonight. 
And I'm really, really praying and feeling very impressed to begin on Wednesday nights when I can. I'll be traveling next week, and then there's the Philippines and other conferences, but when I can. I'm going to be trying to teach on these godly character traits. Amen. Listen to me, church. It's important to have godly character. Amen. And we can always improve on them, every one of us. I think if we're not careful, we focus so much on the outside, which is important. Mm -hmm. We forget the character that God wants us to have. Amen. And every one of these character traits will be biblically based Mm -hmm. and have scriptures to back them up. Amen. I think it's very, very important. Brother Hillman. Amen. Can the church say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Come on, we can do better than that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, why don't you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Amen. Give God the highest praise. Don't be bashful. But give him the highest praise in that word that we use. Amen. To give him the highest praise is hallelujah. Now, in the way of announcements, on the 31st of August, we have a youth service that start at 7 p.m. here at the church. Um, on Tuesday, August 30th, we have a veterans outreach. And I said uh, this morning that our pastor had a burden for us to reach uh, the veterans that's in this area. Amen. To show them some love and let them realize that God loves them and show that we appreciate their service. Because everywhere you go as a veteran, you tell them, hey, can I get a senior discount or a veteran's discount? They say, thank you for your service. So we want to show our veterans that we want to appreciate them and thank you for their service. Can we say amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, Sunday, October 30th, we have uh, a regular morning service, which is at 11 o'clock. It's all possible to get here at 1030 when we go into our Sunday school uh, lessons that we have. And that evening on the October 30th, we're going to have a, a fellowship, a potluck. Um, I don't know if they are going to make a roster or something out there for the potluck um, to certain people or whoever want to put down what they're going to bring. So that way, we won't have the same stuff. You know, you might have three different types of macaroni and cheese. Uh, somebody macaroni and cheese ain't going to be eating, ate up, because you got so many different of the same thing. So it'd be good if we have a roster. So, hey, I'm going to bring this, I'm going to bring that, so we can have a variety of something instead of uh, uh, five different things of macaroni and cheese and, and one thing of mashed potatoes and gravy. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm trying to say, right? So let us have a... Uh, uh, you know, different dishes. So I think it'd be good um, to make a list and say, hey, I'm going to bring this, I'm going to bring that, and see what we see what we got there. Then you say, oh, I can make this instead since he going to make that or she going to make that. I do this. Or I just bring some cookies or some sodas. So I think it'd be good. that. But we want to have a good time. The main thing is not about the eating. It's about the fellowship. Amen. Amen. And myself, I just love fellowship. Amen. So anytime opportunity for me to worship the worship God with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, I'm there. Amen. If I don't bring anything, I'm going to bring myself <laughs> to the potluck. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Uh, I told <laughs> I'm going to bring something. I, yeah, no. But October 31st, we having a, a fall fest that going to begin on uh, 5 p.m. here at the church, a fall fest. In October 6th through the 7th, they're having a Texas State Conference that be starting on Thursday. Um, Thursday, uh, the service is going to start at 7 o'clock. And then Friday at 11.30, it's going to be fellowship. Then Friday at 5 o'clock, it's going to be a business meeting. And then at 6 o'clock, it's going to be service. And the preacher will be conducting that particular service or preaching at that service will be brother, Brotherhood. Amen. So I know several here will probably be at that conference. Amen. We pray that the Lord will bless them with a trip there and a safe trip back. Amen. Praise the Lord. At this time, we would like to receive our offering, our shekel offering, those that have tithes. Now, that conference is open to all of you, so we want you to come and partake 
worship the Lord with us. We're going to have a great time. Ministry from all over the United States will be here. And so we come together and worship the one true God. Praise the Lord. Does anyone else have any other announcements that uh, we need to, you need to present to the church this evening? Anyone else? Or if not, we're going to, oh. Everybody here, she's asking for extra hangers, the ones that you have taking up space for helping to hang up the clothing for the clothing pantry. Amen. And if you do have an offering and you're unable or it's not in the mood to come on up, uh, Elder Phillips, he'd be more than happy to go where you're at to receive your offering or gift that you have for the Lord this evening. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Scotty, shy and timid. Let's have a godly trait tonight. Yes, come on up to the pulpit. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you, Brother Hillman. Amen. Brother Hillman's doing a good job with those announcements. Amen. Gives this old man a little breather. Okay, praise the Lord, church. Wow, that's loud. Okay, um, so I'm going to be speaking on some traits that the Lord has given his people to have that help us to get through uh, some times in our lives. Um, we need to exhibit these traits to people and to each other uh, as a way to show that God is, is in us and with us. Um, the first trait that I would like to talk about tonight is courageous. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, verse uh, thirty, chapter thirty-one, verses six, the Lord, the uh, Scripture says, "Be strong and of a good courage; fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord, thy God, He it is that doth go with thee, will not fail thee, nor forsake thee." Amen. This this verse here, just to give a little background of it, um, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel after he realizes after God has told him that he is not going to make it into the promised land. Um, but he's letting them know that he has one to go before him, that it is going to be Joshua. And he tells not only Joshua, but the people of Israel to be strong and of a good courage. Right. Uh, strength and courage, they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, hand in hand so much that the Lord mentions it seven different times uh, within the Bible. So it obviously has a little bit of importance to us. Um, Strength in this context tends to be more towards the physical, towards more things that we have to uh, endure physically, uh, things that we come across that seem as if physically it's difficult. But in this particular instance, courage is a mental aspect. It's something that mental has God has given to us to tell us to use your in your mind to remember, to think upon God, to dwell upon God. To have the courage to go through all of these things. The, the, the people of, of Israel went into the wilderness at this time. They had so much fear and so much unknown. But God said, be strong and be of a good courage. Amen. Courage is definitely a mental aspect. God has only given us exactly what he knows that we can handle. Uh, he gave the people of Israel what he knew that they could handle. What they knew that they could go for, even though it was 40 years, he knew that they could handle that. So he gave them no more than what they could handle. I know we feel as if things may be impossible, but the God that we serve goes before us in the same manner that he went before them in the wilderness. Those times he told them, I go to prepare thee a promised land where all you have to do is walk in and take what I have given you. And we, as a church body, have the same. All we have to do, as long as we stay true to the word of God and stand in courage, stand in courage that God has gone to prepare for us a place. We are children of the most high God. We serve the one true God of Israel and of the world. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. This should give you the courage to know that no matter what you face, you have God on your side. I'll give you a small example. This church at one time, we were downtown on 8th Street and we had a tabernacle. There was a time when we were in a wilderness state. But now, 
we are in the promised land. We had to endure so many things as a church body. All of us had to go through losses, had to go through physical endurements, had to go through so many trials and tribulations, but look where we've come. If we have the courage to stand up and continue to go forth, look at what we can accomplish. The, the, the days are still many, many more to come. God has not stopped being there for us one iota. We have gone through so many things that have made us strong, so many things. The future trials that we have, don't get me wrong, they're still there. They're always going to be there. But the courage that you project, the courage that you can look through in the word of God will help you to get through every one of those. We have to demonstrate to the world this exact courage. We have to demonstrate to those that we come across on a daily basis this exact courage to know that it, without God, we do not have the strength. That it is God that has given me this courage. It is God that has given me the ability to face this world's troubles, to not give up, but to be strong and of good courage. Amen. Outstanding, Brother Scotty. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Our ensemble may be seated. Amen. Great message this morning. Never fear. God is here. Amen. And I am thankful and give honor to the one that has called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we know that darkness cannot comprehend that light. Amen. The forces of darkness cannot comprehend what God is doing. I give honor to the Lord my God tonight. Give honor to our bishop. I'm going to be reading from the prophet Nehemiah, chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. We're just going to read 17 and then go through those particular verses uh, through the journey of our scripture. We're going to go to verse 21. Excuse me. Amen. Very familiar portion of scripture. Very familiar narrative. And I pray that the concepts of this particular narrative are applied to our spiritual lives today here in the 21st century. They which build on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and the other hand held a weapon. Amen. If we feel comfortable in doing so tonight, can we put our Bibles down? Can we close our eyes and lift our hands? And can we just appreciate what God has done thus far today and what he continues to do in our life? We thank you, Lord God of Jacob for your word and your truth, God, that you are always restoring. God, if our faith is activated in you, is our trust is placed in you, God, you are repairing the breaches of the walls in our life. God, old things have passed away, hence you make all things new. And God, tonight I pray, God, that we understand that you were working on the restoration. And at the other side, we must defend at all costs that restoration in Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight? Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to preach this particular thought, the warrior and the builder. The warrior and the builder. What a dichotomy that those two statements are. That means two separate halves, two opposites. But God expects us to be a warrior and a builder. One, being the builder, you build, you uplift, you create. And a warrior is really twofold within itself. You defend, and if you have to, you have to destroy in the midst of that defense. And God has called you to be a warrior and a defender and a builder in all that you do. In our particular scripture, it is a beautiful transition for the children of Israel. Why I say beautiful? Because it is restoration from the midst of destruction. We are coming to the end of the 70 years of exile that the children of Israel had to endure. Many of you remember from the book of Jeremiah towards the latter part of the book of 2 Kings, which was annotated in the book of Chronicles. The children of Israel, unfortunately, because they chased other gods, they literally sacrificed their children. They lost the city, the great God-given city of Jerusalem 
to the enemies of the east, the Babylonians. The Ark of the Covenant was lost. Not only was it just a piece of furniture, not only did it just represent the Shekinah of God, but it was a piece of identity for the children of Israel. The Babylonians came and destroyed the wall. They sieged the city for a year. They broke down their identity. They broke down their will to fight. They broke down who they were as a people. The priests were killed. The warriors were killed. The city of David was burnt to the ground. The walls were tore down. And those that were deemed worthy to the Babylonians were kidnapped, captured, and sent east to the city of Babylon in modern day Iraq. And this question has been imposed to you multiple times. What was your Babylonian situation? What was stolen from you? What has the enemy attempted to burn down in your life? What bit of identity was confiscated from your spiritual life? But I'm here to tell you tonight that hope is on the way, and you have to be willing to build with one hand and defend with the other in Jesus' name. In this transition of 70 years of exile, the children of Israel were no longer just the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were a currency for the people of Babylon. May I say that again? They were a currency for those that were in charge of Babylon, the leaders of Babylon, the king of Babylon. And I'm here to tell you, when we fall into the exile and the bondage of sin, we become a currency for the forces of darkness. When we serve sin in our flesh, we become currency for Satan. But God never intended for us to be a denomination of currency as if we were some type of exchange rate. God called us to be royalty. God called us to be the children of the light. Be careful not to become currency. As the 70 years progress, the Babylonians lost their authority. The Babylonians crumbled as a society, and they were taken over by the next civilization known as the Persians. The Persians utterly dominated the Babylonians, and now the children of Israel were once again a currency for a new people. They didn't have an identity of Angelus Simmons. All it was was from the Persians to the Babylonians, an exchange rate. I'll give you my Jews. I'll give you my Hebrews. They're great scholars. They're great work. But they were never identified as a people until God moved on a Persian king. I want you to understand the miracle that God used a Persian king to bless the children of Israel. In Persian religion and Babylonian religion and society, the king it's himself was considered a god. The king himself was considered a deity. We saw this with Nebuchadnezzar. They had to bow and worship him. And in Persian culture, and we've even seen it with Esther and her husband, she couldn't just go before the king because he wasn't just simply a king. He was considered a deity. And that was the greatness of the miracle of even Esther. I want you to understand, it wasn't just her husband, but to the eyes of all the Persians that watched, she was a, he was a deity. And so God moved on the Persian king, Artaxerxes. That is a great name. Can you imagine that on a birth certificate? But God moved behind the scenes. For 70 years, they didn't have an identity, but God knew that their hearts were ready for a restoration. God knew that their hearts were operating in repentance an entire generation was lost in 70 years of exile, going from a place that they belong to one hand to another, being a currency of people, but never truly being who they were. But God moved on King Artaxerxes, but God places people where he sees fit. He placed the prophet Nehemiah right into the courtyard of this king. And God gave such favor to this prophet, the prophet said, Oh, king, let me tell you of what my, my parents told me of Jerusalem. Let me tell you what is now in your kingdom. Can you imagine the favor that you would have with all the people if you would restore this great city? 
Now the king could, could have said easily, Nehemiah, why am I even bothering talking to you? Why am I even having a, a conversation with you? But God moved on the heart of this fake deity. God moved on the heart of this ideological king and said, no problem, Nehemiah, what do you need? Here's, here's the kingdom's credit card. Here's the Persian credit card. Never leave home without it. What do you need? Well, I need lumber. I need materials. I need men. Not a problem. Here you go, Nehemiah. That is a miracle in and of itself. When you trust God, God even moves in the midst of your enemies. God even moves in the midst of your enemies to set you up for restoration and a blessing. All you've got to do is trust God and pray for them that to spitefully use you and watch God move in that situation. And so it was an executive order, one that actually meant something. An executive order. You may go back to Jerusalem. Now we know that it was Ezra that was sent on this mission. Ezra, that particular prophet, found the law and restored the spiritual side of Jerusalem and the children of Israel. But Nehemiah was responsible for the engineering. He was the Israel's core of engineers. He was responsible for restoring the beautiful city. And we know that it was three groups, and they went over to Jerusalem. I can only imagine what their heart felt like seeing what was left of their identity. As a city wasn't restored after the Babylonians, it was left to be desolate. And those that moved into whatever was left of the city. But Nehemiah went around the city and surveying the damage and saying, this is what I've got to repair. Every night he went around the walls of Jerusalem and said, I see a hole. I see a breach. I see a place of repair. I see a place that needs some TLC, some tender loving care. I see a place that really needs some work to build up to its former glory, to build up to what God expects to it. God asked us, to assess the places in our life that need restoration. We can't just leave it to happenstance or circumstance, but God requires us to look at ourselves and say, I've got to build, I've got to allow God to restore the breaches and the walls of my promise. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight? So Nehemiah and these engineers were preparing to build their promise, assessing. The thing is, when we are put to a project, especially if it's spiritual, we've got to put our heart into it. We can't just do it out of obligation. There's got to be a passion, a purpose, and an identity to it when you agree, Evangelist Simmons. There is a difference with work when you put a passion and a purpose behind it, when you put an emphasis behind it. To Nehemiah and these children of, the, and these children of Israel and this early party that was building the walls, it was a desperation to rebuild their identity, a desperation to rebuild a relationship with God, a desperation to rebuild what they once had. And we, in our walk with God, have got to self-assess and say, Say, man, I don't pray like I used to pray. I don't fast like I used to fast. There's something going on with my trust. But God has sent you to assess that place and be willing, willing to build with one hand and fight in another. Amen. But I've got to assess. I can't just assume. Because I'm going to miss Jeremiah, I can guarantee in his surveying, knew every brick that needed a repair. This is where David built, elder. This is where my predecessor, our former king, King David, he was in this area. Here's the outer wall. We've got to rebuild it. This is where David dedicated. I've got to rebuild it. This is where David fell prostrate before God. I've got to rebuild it. This is where the glorious temple of God was. I've got to rebuild it. I've got to build all these things to repair my relationship with God. Amen. Nehemiah, 
chapter 4, verse 18. So here they are. The project has begun. God moved on a fake deity, bro. This Persian king, let me sign the check. The lumbers of Jordan, the lumber of Lebanon, whatever you need. All these supplies in the supply chain, and I'm here to tell you there was not a supply chain crisis when it came to this mission. So we start rebuilding. Repentance took place, and God is restoring what the canker worm has devoured. Chapter 4, verse 18, please. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side. They understood. I just spent 70 years in exile. Nobody's going to take this from me again. A generation before me lost their identity. This generation is not going to lose their identity. We're not going to be victims anymore. I'm not going to relinquish my promise. We're not going to relinquish our anointing. We're not going to relinquish our relationship with God. I am ready to fight for it and to die for it if need be. So they had a sword by their side and so build it. Please continue. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. The shofar player, Brother Scotty. The tokia. We know that shofar was for those purposes of calling to assembly, calling to worship, and calling to war. Next verse, please. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people. I love this. The work is great and large. And we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. Nehemiah didn't do it by himself. They did it as a church collective. He said the work is great. When it comes to restoring the things that we've allowed Satan to take or circumstances to take, that work is great and God is with us and we're not alone in it. But can you imagine an entire city that they had to build? Nehemiah, with such passion, said, we're going to get our identity back. We're going to get our purpose back. But the work is great. The damage is extensive, is what he is saying. And we are going to be spread out building as you as engineers. You're going to be so many feet apart, hundreds of feet apart. And if the enemy comes, we've got to ensure that we're not caught out in the open. You're not going to fight alone, but we are going to join together in the fight to defend the restoration, to defend the repair, to defend God restoring things in our life. And we are separate, separated a long ways from each other. Man, can you imagine that construction work? Amen. Can I get the backhoe? Nope, don't have that. By hand. With a sword ready. Next verse, please. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. Amen. So Nehemiah commanded his engineers, when you hear the shofar, fall back to the shofar. There is a battle afoot. We've got to come together. That's where resort ye thither unto us. In old English, it just means come to us. Fall back to us so that we can fight. We have to understand that a church, when we hear a sound from a brother and sister working on restoration, we've got to gather together. Amen. We've got to gather together for what God has built. And we've got to protect each other. And we've got to protect the promise and not allow ourselves to be alone along the wall. But we've got to fight as a unit together, building in one hand and a warrior in the other. Amen. Together. Amen. Next verse, please. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spirits from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. That's what God is looking for in this church. I hope you're listening tonight. This is what God is looking for in this church. Those that are laboring the work, but the ones willing to hold the spears from the rising in the morning until the stars appear. That means from morning to night, God, somebody is willing to fight spiritually. 
For the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I've got to pray like I've never prayed before. We are in a season of restoration. We are in that season of healing. We are in that season of second chances. But us as a church, one has to be willing to labor in the building, and one has to be willing to labor in the fight. For God, God is ready to restore. And as Nehemiah said, God will fight for us. Uh, can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise here tonight? But we've got to do it together. Nobody can be along the wall by yourself. You will become a victim and you will become a casualty along the, road, the wall of your Jerusalem. But we have to be attentive enough to hear the sound of the trumpet, the sound of the shofar gathering us together to build and to fight. Be careful while you're on the line of your wall not to let somebody talk you and distract you when the enemy is creeping up. Remember, Elder, when we had our 360 perimeter? Light and noise discipline. Noise discipline. Not talking, but looking out and ready. Ready to fight when the time comes. We fight in our worship, we fight in our praise, we fight in our prayer, we fight in our submission, we fight in our obedience, we fight, we fight with following the word of God, not just assuming on it, but living the word of God is part of our fight. But if we are not careful and we don't have light and noise discipline in the midst of this rebuilding and fighting, we're going to be caught off guard. I remember basic training drill sergeants with low crawl right up to us. And if you're in the foxhole talking to your buddy, not paying attention, they just snatched the weapons from you. You remember that? Elder, probably when he was in the field, he was that one sneaking up. But that's how the enemy is. They're low crawling on you. Just waiting for you not to pay attention. Just waiting for you to not be attentive enough. Waiting for you to be distracted waiting for you to have an ease in Zion for the enemy to come and to hinder this restoration that we are in. Amen. So Nehemiah and the children of Israel had to deal with these enemies. We have to understand that when God is rebuilding things, the enemy does not want that restoration. When we make the declaration of restoration, when we make the declaration of healing, the enemy you mark my words, the enemy is going to stop at nothing to hinder that restoration. So the word went out to the Persian Empire, and it went to the enemies of Israel. The Arabians, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, those are from Gaza, opposed the wall and all of those in Samaria. The enemy wants nothing more to, than to kill your restoration. The enemy wants nothing more than to kill your healing. The enemy wants nothing more than to stop and stifle the healing process. I'm sure that you've been told by your doctor many times, leave it alone until it's healed, whether it's a wound, whether it's a sickness. I'll be honest, sometimes I don't even listen to the doctor. That's ah, good. Rub some dirt on it. But when it comes to God, there's specific instructions that we have to listen from the great and wise physician. We cannot just assume, but we have to understand. The children of Israel fought for 52 days straight. They belt, they fought, and every time the shofar went and blew, they gathered together as one force and fought the enemy with a stone in one hand and a sword in another. God has called you here tonight to be a builder, to build up your faith, to build up the gifts, but to allow God to build you. But before I can allow or to participate in the building of the church, I've got to ensure that I'm built up. God has called you to be a builder, and that is a, a spiritual skill craft that if we're not careful is perishable. We lose it. We have to build one stone at a time. 
that was stone of faith, the stone of trust, the stone of obedience, the stone of submission, the stone buried in the word of God. But the enemy wants to whisper, why are you even bothering? This will come down again. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That's that darkness that is not comprehending what God is doing. That's darkness that did not take or cannot translate what God is doing. They don't understand. The enemy sees it as opposition. But we have to be determined that these blessings, this restoration, this hope, this faith, this trust are my stones and brick and mortar, one layer at a time until my promise is built. We have to have a determination, no matter what, that I've got to allow God to build it up in my life once again. But not only that, I've got to fight for it. God called you to be a builder and a warrior. A builder and a fighter. If God has restored my marriage or my relationship with my children or my relationship with him, I can't just leave the door open for somebody to rob the house again. I've got to put security. I've got to be well armed. I've got to put a no trespassing sign. Or in the state of Texas, I just paint a post purple. That works as no trespassing. Am I right, Brother Scotty? But that's to let the enemy know that there is going to be opposition of what God had just built in my life. But what happens to apostolics is it could be in a conference, at a youth camp, a special speaker. It's something is rebuilt, but we step away with our sword. And we allow the Babylonians to come back. We've got to be willing to build and to fight here tonight. Somebody here tonight, your Jerusalem seems like it's in tatters. Your Jerusalem and your promise seems like it is become, as Jeremiah called it, a desolation. That means without life, without growth. That means destruction. But i here to tell you tonight that God sees it another way. God sees it as an art project. God sees it as a construction project. God sees beauty from the ashes of your Jerusalem. And here tonight, somebody needs to trust God. He's been trying to hand you the stones of your wall for the last several weeks in services. From what Bishop has preached, what has gone forth from this pulpit. God is trying to hand you the materials to your rebuilding of Jerusalem. But some of us feel that we're not worthy. But God is handing it to you. Obviously, there's some worth there. And it's at this altar that we rebuild. The children of Israel were passionate for their fight for their things of God. What the enemy does in this society is wither away our willingness to fight. And we lose the willingness to fight. We lose the willingness to build. And when we build, things fail. Things crumble. And if we're not careful, it becomes the desolation of what God started. Don't lose your willingness to fight. You're a warrior and you are a builder. You are a dichotomy of God's purpose here tonight. And the time has come for us to fight and to build for what God has given us. May the Lord bless you tonight. Bishop, anything you would like to add, sir? Amen. If we feel comfortable in doing so tonight, can we stand to our feet? And can we just focus on God for just a little bit more time tonight? Can we close our eyes and lift our hands? People are already coming to the altar. That, that is God issuing out the building material to your promise. And when it is built, we've got to be willing to fight. Can we close our eyes and lift our hands? Lord God of Jacob, I thank you, Lord, first that you have given us a building plan. God, you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. God, you have bestowed the building plans which are your intentions. 
God, you loved us from the foundation of the world. God, you had a purpose for us since the foundation of the world. And God, what you have set in place, no man can take away. God, there is still hope while we're breathing for a rebuilding and a fighting for our promise. God, tonight I pray for a determination of the prophet Nehemiah willing to travel, willing to sacrifice, willing to build, willing to fight from what the enemy has taken, what the canker worm has devoured. And God, let it be a determination in this house for restoration and defense. God, let the builders arise. Let the warriors arise. Let the worshipers arise here tonight, God, and restore, God, restore what the cake of worm has taken. Jesus, Jesus. Amen. We're not going to formally dismiss tonight. We have many that are praying at the altar. Amen. It was good to see everyone this evening. We will see you Wednesday. Amen. And those that are praying, we just ask that we give them an opportunity to pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week. In Jesus' name.